Chapter 13, The Principles of Pharmacology. Let's get started. It's a little introduction here. This is kind of a heavy-hitting chapter. It's pretty important. You're going to want to refer back to it often as you go through your paramedic schooling. So medication administration is a defining element of our practice, of course. We can use medications to correct or decrease the severity of an illness or injury, use it to manage life-threatening conditions, conditions and to substantially reduce patient discomfort everything from restarting someone's heart all the way through just giving them pain control trying to prevent worsening heart attacks medications are very important for us severe and often life-threatening consequences can occur though if we are not careful and we do make mistakes if we give the wrong medication or something that's not intended or doesn't have the correct indication. So we do have to be very careful with this. Pharmacology is the scientific study of how various substances interact with or alter the function of living organisms. That is the definition of pharmacology. Kind of a history, quick history about it. There's medications that have been around for hundreds of years. Started off with plants and animals that were kind of used in different ways and natural remedies and they were used to resolve certain symptoms and now a lot of it that we use today is synthetically formulated but there is still some animal-based medicines that we use insulin being one of those everything now is evidence-based guidelines that creates um, or guides how we make medications get new medications approved all that stuff there's a huge long process takes several years to get a new medication approved the u.s uh, fda is in charge of it ever since 1938 they've been in charge of regulating all of the medications in 1906 the pure food and drug act prohibited altering or mislabeling medications and then in 1909 we had an opium act that came through that prevented importing opium 1914 the harrison narcotic act restricted use of opiates and, nar and and cocaine and then in 1938 they said you know what we're just gonna give the fda full control over this and they've been in charge of our drug regulation ever since like i said approval of any new medications take several years most of the time unless there's one recent medication it got approved in a few months but that was for something different some medications we use are considered off-label there's a relatively new medication out there uh, it was designed for treating type 2 diabetics but they found out that it really helps with weight loss it's semaglutide and it's not technically approved by the fda for weight loss it is only approved for treating type 2 diabetics but they're using it off-label for weight loss i imagine soon the FDA will probably approve it for weight loss, but we'll see. Currently, it is an off-label use for weight loss. Controlled Substances Act of 1970. They set up this kind of five-step uh, scheduling of different medications, saying how hot or what's the chance of them being used, you know, inappropriately, and if if there's any recognized medical purpose for those drugs so that's five five schedules or five categories schedule one drug high abuse potential technically no recognized medical purpose uh, it gives the examples there heroin marijuana and lsd marijuana of course as we all know in the past 10 or 15 years has changed quite a bit but technically by the federal standards it is still a schedule one uh, drug i imagine that'll change in the next five years they'll probably change to a schedule two or three but we'll see technically right now it is schedule one uh, schedule two has a high abuse potential but they also have legitimate medical purposes fentanyl cocaine ritalin all of those are schedule two drugs schedule three a little bit lower potential for abuse hydrocodone tylenol with codeine and ketamine are all good examples there Schedule 4 is going to be a little bit lower potential for abuse, and then Schedule 5. So anything, any drug that we have on the ambulance from Schedule 2 through Schedule 5 has to have 
like a certain system of tracking it has to be locked up between behind like two sets of locks there's a lot of record keeping that has to be done on anything that falls on that schedule uh, controlled medication list through there sources of medication different places we can get it plants animals minerals microorganisms synthetic of course how a lot of stuff is made now just in a complete in a laboratory or synthetic where it's a mixture of both chemicals and natural substances that's made it and of course they finish it up in a lab pharmaceutical companies control the concentration purity preservatives other ingredients all that they control to an extent of when this stuff can expire and they have to keep good records of all that with lot numbers all that stuff a bunch of different forms of medication capsules tablets those are probably the two most commonly seen ones at your house in your you know in your medicine cabinet Tylenol ibuprofen stuff like that it's gonna be those capsules and tablets and then we have that we use more in EMS some of the powders like glucagon solumedrol something like that that's we have to mix back up there's droplets parenteral stuff we're going to put in through the IV uh, skin prep where it's a gel that you just put on the outside of the skin suppository that goes up the behind there's liquid stuff a lot of our infant and child medicines are going to be a liquid form and then inhaler and sprays albuterol stuff like that for asthma it's going to be for an inhaler so know that those are different forms of medications that you might see on the ambulance every medication has at least three different types of names chemical name is a very long drawn out name that you're not going to be you don't need to worry about it uh, they don't use it in clinical practice and it's very very long non-proprietary or generic name that's what we're going to see probably most often uh, the drugs are given that generic name whenever they're being made and then there's also a brand name to go along with that something like fentanyl fentanyl is the generic name sublimase is a brand name for that there you go there's an example of a chemical name you know it's super long for chlor uh, all that generic names furosemide brand names lasik some medications have this tall man lettering and it all it is to do is to help you not mix up medications so diphenhydramine and diamond hydronate are similar sounding words so they put that tall man lettering there on on the end of the word to kind of help prevent any confusion and mixing up those medications because they're completely different meds and so it would be very detrimental to our patients if we were to mix those up so tall man lettering is a thing that we use now too we need to have good medication reference sources for all of our medications uh, your protocol book should be a reliable source anything in this textbook is a reliable source you can use Hippocrates that's a good app you can download um, be careful with just googling medications some of that stuff isn't real accurate but uh, you can find lots of good accurate reliable sources and you need to have those accessible some of them you might have to pay a little bit for but like this textbook, I mean, you're technically paying for that. The USPF and the PDR, Physician's Desk Restaurants, have vast quantities of information about any medication we're going to use. Not, maybe not so much real easily searchable, although I'm sure there's probably an app for that nowadays that makes it a little bit easier to search. But they go way down deep into the chemical formulations on all those medications. Probably not the most easiest for uh, paramedics to understand. But it is another resource we can use. So, of course, anytime you get a medication, they have the inserts that talks about dosing, routes of administration, contraindications, adverse effects. Your protocol should have all that. You don't want to base your treatment off what the insert in the little bottle comes with. But... We want to base all of our treatments based off our protocols, of course. 
Hospital pharmacies, they have all those formularies for any medications they keep on site. American Medical Association drug evals has more information. Okay, AHA classifications for the American Heart Association. They classify all the medications that they recommend during pretty much cardiac arrest, but all, all of their different algorithms. So a class one drug is the best. Strong evidence supporting its use. We want to give this every time we have X, Y, and Z condition. Class 2A, moderate evidence. We think it's good. Class 2B has weak evidence. Well, we don't really know whether it's helping or not, but it doesn't seem to be hurting. That sort of thing. And then class three, it's like, well, there's not really any evidence to say this is going to help. So they classify all their drugs. And then a class indeterminate, there's just no, no real research on that at this time. Medication storage, we have to have good protection for it, especially if it's controlled substance. You know, it's got to be behind locked doors. Got to be convenient, of course. You don't want it to get broken, some sort of protective bin and should be sorted out so that you can quickly identify it and not mix up different medications. That's the best way. Of course, keep it out of direct sunlight, extreme temperatures, physical damage. If you can have it in climate-controlled storage, that's the best. Uh, like I said, controlled substances have to have that additional layer of security, an extra lock, a lot more records and paperwork involved with it, and they also have to have documentation of how those medications are being disposed of, whether they're just expiring out or whether you've given some of it to a patient, you got a little bit left in the vial, and you're wasting that, you have to keep track of all that stuff. Every last milliliter or milligram's got to be documented. Uh, the states come in quite a bit and audit that stuff. They want to see how you're keeping those records and all that. I recommend anytime you make shift change and you're given all those narcotic medications, go through them, inspect them, look at them, see if any of the tops have been popped off, see if any of the tops are maybe taped on. Maybe it's just incidental that they're taped on there. Just look at all those different vials that you've been given just to make sure there's no issues. You don't want to be part of that investigation when the next day someone's like, oh yeah, that that lid was, had come off. It's like, well, I don't know. I didn't really check my drugs yesterday. So make sure you're inspecting all that stuff so that you're not part of anything sketchy. Okay. Prince or the physiology of pharmacology. Medications are administered to produce a desired effect in the body, of course. Pharmacodynamics is the alteration of a function or process of the body as medication is administered and any medication can cause toxic effects of course so pharmacodynamics and you're going to hear the term pharmacokinetics in a minute but pharmacodynamics is how the medication is changing the body so you give fentanyl pharmacodynamics says that it relieves pain in the body okay that's pharmacodynamics it's going to be on a test remember it Especially, we're going to get into the difference between kinetics and dynamics. So, dynamics, how the medication changes the body. Process of medication administration. It's absorbed in, whether through the skin or IV, whatever. It's distributed, biotransformed, and then it's eliminated. Pharmacokinetics is the action of the body on a medication. So, kinetics is how the body changes the medication. Dynamics is how the medication changes the body. Pharmacokinetics is how the body changes the medication. So it's breaking it down, it's eliminating it, it's biotransforming it into other little molecules and drugs. <clears throat> Receptor sites exist in proteins connected to cells. Okay, Receptors are activated by endogenous chemicals or exogenous chemicals. So whether it's something that's naturally in the body or whether it's something that we're giving to them. When a medication binds with a receptor, it either does one of four things. Channels permitting the passages of ions in the cell walls may be opened and letting 
that medication in or letting other stuff into those cells. A biochemical messenger becomes activated, which then initiates other chemical reactions within cells. A normal cell function may be prevented. Maybe it prevents the opening of a certain cellular channel. Or a normal or abnormal cell function begins. So the, any medication we give will cause one of those four different things. Medications bind with particular cell receptors. Newer medications are more specific to the receptor site. Something like albuterol. Albuterol is a great beta-2 agonist. It is going to help open up the airways and relax that smooth muscle. But it also has some beta-1 effects. We'll talk more about this later. But beta-1 effects. And it's not super targeted to the only that beta-2. Levalbuterol is a newer medication that is more targeted to only that beta-2 receptor site. So as the science progresses, drugs get more specific to those receptor sites, and so they can have less adverse effects on the body or less other, not only adverse effects, but just other effects. You can use, be more targeted to what you need. So there's two types of medications that affect cellular activity, agonist and antagonist. Agonist drugs here. So picture on the left, you get natural chemicals that come in. They bind with your receptor site. Normal cell activity. Agonist, like, it's like throwing gas on a fire type thing. You get those natural chemicals. You're throwing in an agonist drug, and it's going to have enhanced cellular activity. It's going to rev that engine up. Antagonists are going to come in, and they're going to block those receptor sites. So antagonists prevent natural cellular activity that's going to happen by the normal chemicals that are in there. So it depends on what we're doing in the body as to whether we want an agonist or an antagonist. But agonist, remember, enhance cellular activity. Antagonist, or anti, stops the cellular activity. Everything has an affinity, of course. It's the ability of a medication to bind with particular receptor sites. So we need it to be very... We need to have a high affinity. I'm not sure if there's a better word for that. Uh, and that way it can overpower kind of those natural chemicals and bind with those receptor sites. Of course, they're going to initiate or alter that cell action. Threshold level, anytime we give any medication, it's not going to be uh, effective until we hit a certain threshold. So. If we only give, say, 12 micrograms of fentanyl, it's not enough in the body to really start blocking all those pain receptors. Not until we get up to 25, 50, or 100 micrograms will we really start seeing the effects of that. So that's hitting that threshold level. We have to get it up above there, enough of that drug in the body, that medication in the body, before it starts to alter cellular activity. Potency is the concentration medication required to get that. So that's all about concentration and how diluted down your medication is. Fentanyl is much more potent than morphine. So where we might get 4 milligrams of morphine, we might only give 50 micrograms of fentanyl to get the very similar pain control responses in the body. Efficacy is the ability to initiate or alter cell activity in a therapeutic or uh, desired manner. So here's a little diagram kind of showing it. You know, we give just a little bit of the drug, whatever it is, and it falls into that no effect range. And then we hit that threshold. And then it's going to increase, increase, increase pain control. Say, you know, using fentanyl, for example, again. It's going to cause more and more pain control until it hits that maximum, maximum effective range where all those receptor sites are now blocked up or taken up and it can't provide more effect. It's hit that maximum effective range. And every drug is different as where they fall in that threshold and the range between maximum effective. Antagonist medications. Competitive antagonists will temporarily bind with cellular receptor sites, 
their efficacy is related to the concentration near the receptor sites and their infinity or affinity compared with the affinity of the agonist chemicals present so a little example here narcan or naloxone is a competitive antagonist you've given an opiate that's our agonist and then maybe you gave a little bit too much so you give some narcan it's antagonist concentrations high enough hits the threshold level knock some of those opiate uh, cells off and reverses some of the effects of that so it's based on the affinity and the concentration there both of those together determines its efficacy it's competitive though so if the uh, half-life is less than whatever our pain control was our opiate that we give it's going to be used up by the body and biotransformed and excreted by the body before the pain control opiate has been excreted by the body. And, and uh, so we might have to give a second dosage of that to compete again and get back up there so that we don't have the respiratory depression or whatever it is that was the initial issue that we had to give the Narcan. Non-competitive antagonism. Antagonist permanently binds with that receptor site and prevents activation by agonists. So no matter what, it's done. Continuation of effects until new receptor sites or cells are created, and they cannot be overcome by increased doses of agonist medications. Partial agonist binds to receptor site, do not initiate as much cellular activity as others, lower the efficacy of other agonists. Partial agonist, we got like Suboxone, I believe that's going to be a partial agonist medication, where it's going to cause some pain control. It's for people who are addicted to opiates, pretty much, and it's going to cause some pain control, and it's also going to block that, those site, receptor sites, so that you can't overdose near as easily on that. So, keep that in mind, it has that ceiling effect where you can't go too far. Some medications or mechanisms of drug action. They're engineered to target microorganisms, lipids, water, exogenous, toxic substances. Depends on what the medication is. Antimicrobials can target specific substances present in the cell walls of bacteria and fungi. And chelating agents help bind with heavy metals to get those out of the body. Something like activated charcoal can be considered a chelating agent. Sodium bicarb as well to help get rid of some of those heavy metals. Diuretics create osmotic change, help the kidneys function better in some cases, and they will help excrete more fluids and electrolytes, and they'll alter that in the body. Mannitol is another diuretic, helps get fluid off the brain. Electrolyte-based ba medications change the concentration and distribution of ions in the cells and fluids throughout the body. Factors affecting some of our responses depends on what medication we choose, how specific it is to those target receptors. The dose, of course, the route, timing, manner of administration, monitoring. That doesn't really affect the response, I don't think. Something to keep in mind. Age of our patient. Water-soluble medications might be, they're going to be different based on how much water concentration the patient has. Infants, elderly people, they have different fat and water uh, ratios than your typical middle-aged person. And so their dosages might be a little bit different. That's why we titrate a lot of it, you know, with the kids is weight-based. And then with the older folks, a lot of times we'll, sometimes we will reduce the dose because their body composition has changed and also their liver and kidney functions have changed and how the medication is excre excreted. Weight-based medication dosing, like I mentioned, especially for the kids, it's proportional, given proportionally to the size of the patient. Manufacturers figure out all those dosage ranges. Something that you have to do is, of course, convert it all to kilograms. It does not consider alterations in the distribution metabolism and elimination. 
but for the most part it does pretty well. And some are based on ideal body weight, not actual body weight. So that's a whole other calculation that they'll mention here in a minute, the, the formula for that. Uh, just because you are six foot tall and 200 pounds versus six foot tall and 500 pounds doesn't mean you automatically need two and a half times more medication. If it's based on ideal body weight, you're still going to go off of that six foot tall, 200 pound patient. Some other stuff that can affect how the body uses medicines, environment, hyperthermia. Your body's hot, it's working hard, and it can increase the metabolism of the drug. May reduce the amount of drug returned to circulation just because it's being filtered out that much faster. One other thing with hyperthermia though, whenever you have a fever, a lot of times the liver, the cytochrome P450 system, which is a big thing for eliminating and biotransforming uh, drugs in the body and medications in the body, whenever you have a fever, that system kind of shuts down a little bit as a protective function. So might not make too much difference in how long that drug lasts in the body. Hypothermia, though, is something that we actually need to pay attention to especially with cardiac arrest because once a body gets so cold typically below 90 degrees 85 really uh, they're just not able to uh, the cells in the body are too cold they're not able to respond to those medications that you give so you know you have to just do cpr pretty much until you get that cardiac arrest victim warmed back up and then you can start with your acls drugs once they're above 85 degrees core temperature. If they're too cold, it's just not going to work. Genetic factors, of course, can't really go into all the genetic factors, but there could be lots of different ones that change how the body uses those medications. Primary pulmonary hypertension, sickle cell, and glucose 6-phosphate are three big ones that change it. But if you have some weird genetic disease, just to talk to the family, talk to the patient. Hey, have you ever had this medication before? Does it have any effect on you? Talk to them, use them as a source of information. Pregnancy, of course, changes everything. With that, the cardio or cardiac output, of course, and intravascular volume increases. Our hematocrit actually decreases. Respiratory tidal volume and minute volume increase. Our inspiratory and expiratory reserve volumes can decrease. GI motility decreases. Renal blood flow, urination increases. So uh, pregnancy can change a lot. And then we also need to be considering how those medicines are going to affect the baby inside of there. Here is the five different classes that have pretty much been phased out, I believe, by this point. So a, a class A... Pregnancy class A medication says, hey, this is safe to give for everybody. No risk of fetal harm. No risk of mom's harm. All the way down to class X. Don't ever give that one. It's going to harm the baby. Could harm the mom. And it outweighs any possible benefit. Benzodiazepines are class D. So Versed, Valium, Ativan. Those are going to be our class D. And we are going to use those very very cautiously with anybody who's pregnant but they've pretty much switched to instead of being a class a through x they're switching to this other way of categorizing them that is more descriptive and actually kind of gives you a little bit more information so you can use that to to make a wiser decision on your medications some psycho psychosocial factors that can affect how the medications work course everybody's different everybody feels pain anxiety and discomfort differently um, and placebo effect is a real thing so if I'll just leave it at that plus <laughs> everybody's a little bit different and how they perceive pain and things like that can be different and just the fact that they're getting any type of medication might they might think that they feel better even if it wasn't a pain medication so that that can happen remember we don't want to try to 
induce a placebo effect. We don't want to falsify and uh, mess with their neurologic state or psycho psychosocial state, if you will, and intentionally try to mislead them and think that they're getting a medication when they're really not. That's not ethical. Therapeutic effects of medications based on the patient's illness, injuries, complaints, signs, symptoms, of course. And their condition should match the use or indication list on the medication profile. Simple enough. We want to give aspirin to someone who's having chest pain, not aspirin to someone who's cut their arm off. Always match our indications to the patient and to the medication. Medication is administered in a dose intended to produce a desired clinical response. Some require repeat dose, and those, these are capable of demonstrating cumulative action. So sometimes the body is able to break those down and, and get rid of them very efficiently and quickly. So we have to give a repeat dose or a continual dose. It just depends on what the medication is. Adverse effects. Just anything that might happen that we don't really want to happen. Might be an allergic reaction. Might be some nausea. Could be really anything. Just adverse effect is anything that we don't want to happen. Remember, people who have chronic medical conditions, or they're able, or they're taking lots of different medications, and then we give them another one that might interact with one of the previous medications that they're already prescribed. That can really set them off. So we just want to be cautious of that. Most drugs, though, in EMS are eh, relatively safe, and we're giving it for an emergency reason. And so, as long as we're aware of the different adverse effects, and educate our patient about those. May range in severity, of course. Side effects can be desirable in certain situations and harmful in others. Some things that we don't expect at all, they're just called idiosyncratic medication reactions. So maybe they, the patient itself, themselves have a genetic factor that has changed how they respond to that medication. And just know that it's called idiosyncratic and just completely unexpected. There's no way to be prepared for that. You just, you know, if it's allergic reaction, you give them some Benadryl or whatever else. All right, therapeutic index. The median lethal dose kills 50% of the population. So say 10 grams of medication X kills 50% of the population. Well, there you go. That's our median lethal dose. Maybe 5 grams of medication X causes a toxic dose where they have toxic effects. Maybe they don't really die, but they have toxic effects. So there's our median toxic dose. And then the medium, median effective dose, so say 1 gram of medication X causes that effective dose. So we really only need to give 1 gram, and if we gave 10 grams, we would kill them. There is the breakdown of that. Therapeutic index is the relationship between that median effective dose and the median lethal dose. The wider that is, the safer that medication is. So 1 gram is our median effective dose. 10 grams is the lethal dose. That's a big jump to get to 10 grams. So it's a relatively safe medication. A small difference, say our effective dose is only 1 gram, but then our lethal dose is one and a half grams. That's a very small difference, very small therapeutic index, and can be very detrimental if we give that to the patient. So that's just kind of a reference of how safe a drug is. Something to keep in mind. Another type of medication response that we get is the immune-mediated response, allergic reaction pretty much. Genetically predisposed patients have an initial exposure sensitiz sensitization to an allergen or that medication that you give. And then they will be extra sensitive. You'll get into allergic reactions more in a different chapter, but this is kind of just a brief overview. And the second time you give that medication is when they really have the problem with it or you get that allergic reaction, maybe anaphylaxis if it's really bad. But that's when you, you get that response. So just know that that is another type of medication response that we need to be aware of. Just allergic reactions. Medication tolerances. Some certain medications have a de decreased efficacy when taken repeatedly. So they don't work as well. 
if you take a narcotic long term you're going to require higher and higher doses of it to make it as effective tolerances result from either a down regulation or it can be an up regulation but typically down regulation of the available cell receptors for a particular medication so the body says hey i'm being given this medication i don't need to produce it as much and I don't need as many cell receptors because I've got so much of it already in the body. So your body down regulates that and not producing as much on its own. So it could cause some tolerance there. Cross tolerance and tachyphylaxis. Cross tolerances would be like repeated exposure to a medication within a particular class that is, you know, maybe you're given two different types of pain medicines that are both opiates. So you, even though you're you were on oxycodone and now you're on hydrocodone they're going to be cross tolerant to both of them because they are still the same class of med medication sometimes if you get tachyphylaxis that's going to be like given a bunch of repeated doses of that certain medication in a short time period and so you just quickly build up that cross or that tolerance to it you can also get some medication abuse and dependence on that. Falling are prone to misuse stimulants and depressants, both of them. Repeat exposure can cause habituation, and you're now reliant on that. I think we all are familiar with different types of dependencies. Caffeine is probably most one of our biggest ones in EMS. And let's say prolonged or significant exposure can cause de or can cause dependence, of course. If you suddenly stop using that caffeine, for example, you can have physical, emotional, behavioral changes, you can be really grumpy, all that good stuff. So abuse and dependence are two very real things, of course. Medication interactions. Medication interference is under undesirable medication interactions. Different medications mixing with each other would be a type of medication interference. And something else, a major concern is incompatibility during administration. So if you've got an IV line set and you're giving two different types of medicines, sometimes they're incompatible together and you have to have actually two separate IV lines given it. Otherwise, calcium is a big one. If you're given calcium, you want to give it by itself, nothing else on that IV line. Pretty much all your electrolytes have them on their own IV line, and then if you're also giving, you know, maybe a blood pressure support or sedative, something else, you want to have a separate IV line just so you don't get that incompatibility. Know that medications can increase or decrease or alter the effect of another medication. I believe we talk a little bit more about that in a little bit synergism and all that i believe we t we discuss that a little bit more principles of pharmacokinetics so remember coconut pharmacokinetics is how your body changes that medication gets rid of that medication as a medication is administered the body begins removing it immediately duration and effectiveness are de determined by the dose the route of administration and the clinical status of the patient so really sick patients that maybe their body's kind of given up they're not going to be able to remove that uh, medication quite as easily or as quickly. Pharmacokinetics section of a medication profile states the onset, the peak, and the duration. So the onset would be how long after I give this medicine is it going to start working? When am I going to have my peak effects of it? And how long is it going to last in the body altogether? The route of administration must allow delivery of the appropriate amount to the correct location. Something to keep in mind, you know, we give a lot of our drugs via IV form. If we were to give the same dose orally and they were to swallow that, it wouldn't be an appropriate amount because the body biotransforms it and filters it out so quickly that it just wouldn't, wouldn't be effective. So that routes of administrations are important and it changes our dose dramatically. Bioavailability is the percentage of unchanged medication that reaches systemic circulation. 
technically anything we give IV has 100% bioavailability because we're giving it directly into there. Anything that you take orally before it ever gets into the system, really, in system, systemic circulation, it's being filtered through the liver so that bioavailability is a lot lower, typically. Oral, given anything orally, patients must be responsive, able to swallow, may need an NG or an OG tube, just depends on what's going on with them. Things that can affect that is GI motility and how well the GI tract is working and perfused. GI pH, how acidic it is, can change some of that. And the presence of food or liquids or chemicals in the stomach can also affect how those medications are absorbed. You know, some medications say only take this with breakfast or with food in your stomach. You don't want to take it on an empty stomach. And that way it's absorbed into the body a little bit better or a lot better. Another route to keep in mind is endotracheal, putting something down the ET tube once they're intubated. Not something that we've done in at least the past 15 years. I don't know. Uh, it's not considered really a reliable source. If you have to do it that way, give it two to two and a half times the IV dose, follow it with a five to 10 milliliter slush, flush. Only time I can ever really see this happening is maybe you're working a cardiac arrest, can't get an IV. For whatever reason, you can't get an IO at all, and you're wanting to still give like epi or something like that. Technically, I guess you could put it down the ET tube, but since the invention of IOs, you can pretty much always get an IO. There's always some place on the body that you can get an IO. So uh, just know that it is another route that you can give the body and give medications. Intranasal is a popular one. Of course, we all know Narcan, squirting Narcan up the nose. It is converted into a mist. has a little atomizer on there on the, the end of the syringe. You spray it up the nose. Absorption is rapid. Bioavailability is close to 100%, and you don't have to worry about needle stick. So if you got someone having a seizure and you want to give them a sedative, squirt it up the nose, and nobody gets harmed with needles. Something you want to keep in mind if you are going to give it intranasally is have them take a nice, if possible, try to do it on inhalation or have them take a nice deep breath and that way it gets more into the lungs and it gets absorbed more quickly. IVs, of course, is our preferred method. Insert a catheter into a peripheral or central vein. Bioavailability is 100%. Onset for those medications is very rapid does have several limitations, of course, though. People who have bad veins and are hard to get IVs on, that's going to be an issue. If they've, a, you know, previous IV drug abuser causes their veins to be very hard, and collapse and stuff like that, that's hard to get IVs on those people. Someone's in real bad shock, blood pressure's junk over junk, they're going to be hard to get IVs on. So anybody who's hard to get an IV on, that's that's pretty much the limitation here. Is just not able to get an IV. But it's always our kind of our gold standard there is to get an IV started. IO, anything we can give IO or IV, we can also give IO. All the medications are the same. You're going to insert a needle into the bone and into the bone marrow. You can leave it in place up to 24 hours. You don't want to give it to a broken bone, of course. Someone who's had a knee replacement, we try to avoid that as well. Or if we know they've got screws in that knee or leg or sight, then we want to avoid that as well. Lots of different places you can give it. Proximal tibia is generally the most popular, but you can do it, you know, distal femur, distal tibia even. Humerus is pretty popular. The sternum, a lot of military protocols call for a sternum IO. And it's, it looks pretty aggressive whenever you're doing it, but it's very effective and it really doesn't cause that much pain to a patient, from what I've been told. Never had one done on myself. I am just shooting a little bit of the medication through a needle into the large muscle, typically up in the deltoid muscle, up in the arm. Bioavailability is 75 to 100%, and you want to confirm that the medication is appropriate for IM use particular muscle that you want to use and a particular technique for injection should be used. We'll get into all that in chapter 14. 
Uh, remember, the bigger the muscle, the more medication it can give. You don't want to give two milliliters or three milliliters of fluid into the deltoid in the upper arm. You're going to have to go in the butt, bigger muscle there, if you're going to give those larger amounts. One other thing on that, this is also where, you know, we mentioned patients' lipid stores or fat can make a difference on how well it's absorbed into the body. IM is a big part of that. You're putting it into that fatty tissue or the muscle, and based on what the medication is, uh, changes how quickly it can be absorbed if they have more fat, less fat more or less water, stuff like that. That's why our dosages for IM is so much different than just giving it IV. We have a protocol for ketamine for pain control. If we give it IV, we can give you know up to 10 milligrams. If we're giving it IV, we can give five times that dose. We can give 50 milligrams if we're giving it IM. I hope I said that right. IV, 10 milligrams, IM, 50 milligrams just because of the way that it's absorbed into the body more slowly and available for the body to use. Subcutaneous, you're giving it just underneath the skin. Insulin is one of those that is done that way. Not very much use in EMS, probably more hospital use. You're going to use do more subcutaneous. Um, know that you can give that. Slower absorption room. May prevent adverse cardiovascular effects, of course. It's going to be absorbed more slowly. Epinephrine for anaphylaxis. You can give it sub-Q or IM. I think all of us are going to give it IM, uh, but you can give it sub-Q. Dermal and transdermal, so you got a patch, fentanyl patch, nicotine patch, whatever the patch might be, nitroglycerin. Uh, it's just absorbed in slowly through the skin. Delivers a relatively constant dose of the medication during a long period. So usually those are rated, you know, it's going to give, say for fentanyl, 50 micrograms per hour over eight hours. So that's how that works. Something that can change how quickly that is absorbed into the body is sweat and how open those pores are can change some of that too. Sublingual, bioavailability is low. Large doses are required. M patient must be conscious and alert. Nitro is a big one that we give that way. Give it underneath the tongue, very vascular under there, and we're going to use it that way. Inhaled or nebulized, albuterol breathing treatments are going to be our big ones. That's just another way. It's getting into the lungs, and it's absorbed into the lungs and into the vasculature that way. Rectal is a way to do things too. If someone is unresponsive, having seizures, vomiting, unable to swallow, no, you could go rectally with that. Kids with seizures, a lot of times if they're prescribed an emergency medication at home, they'll be like Valium or something like that, and it'll be a rectal suppository that they're given. And Ophthalmic, you got to put it in the eye. Hemodialysis, so if someone's getting dialysis, you can mix in some medications to that. And just remember, follow your protocols. Don't do anything you're not trained to do and not comfortable doing. All right, distribution of medicines. How a medication moves through the body is determined by the medication itself, the chemical properties of it, physical properties, and then, of course, our patient and their clinical status. If they're in shock, it's going to change things. Age, all that good stuff. Medications must move through protective barriers to be effective. You know, those medication molecules have to go into the cells somehow. So whether it's going to be passive, passively brought into the cell or an act of transport. Osmosis is used to enhance the distribution of certain medications, allows IV fluids to leave the intravascular space and enter various tissues. Filtration is the process within the body that is used to redistribute water and other particles, of course. Hydrostatic pressure forces various fluids against semipermeable membranes, causing the passage of certain substances into an adjacent compartment. 
So if you put a bunch of super salty water, hypertonic solution into the IV, it's going to draw a lot of fluid out of the uh, muscles and extravascular space. And it's bringing all that in. That hydrostatic pressure is bringing all the fluid into the intravascular space to try to equalize our, our uh, uh, tenacity of that medicine or that, that fluid. Epithelial cells create a continuous barrier, of course. Small non-ionic and lipophilic molecules can pass easily through those. Larger hydrophilic and ionic molecules must find another route. So penocytosis, where it's engulfed by the cell and brought in, facilitated diffusion or active transport. So facilitated diffusion doesn't require ATP for absorption, and then active transport actually uses ATP to get those cells into, or get that medication into the cells. Medications must also move through capillary walls to reach stem cells. Three different areas in the body have extra barriers, the blood-brain barrier, blood placenta barrier, and the blood testes barrier. So it prevents some of the medications that we give from actually getting into the brain or the placenta and the baby or the testes. Dopamine is a something that's kind of always mentioned. The brain produces a lot of dopamine. It's a feel-good drug. We also can give dopamine in EMS, but the dopamine that we give in EMS, we use for typically cardiogenic shock or something like that and raising blood pressure. And the blood-brain barrier actually protects the brain and it is not able to get the dopamine that we give. Kind of crazy, even though the body's producing its own dopamine, the stuff that we give, it can't get through that blood-brain barrier. Plasma protein binding. Medication molecules temporarily attach to proteins in the blood plasma. Concentration of medication may change as the plasma protein levels change. And another medication that binds with plasma protein is introduced. So all that, depending on what the medication is, can really affect how it gets into the body. Lipophilic medications can be sequestered in the fat tissue of an obese person and sometimes are released slowly, causing prolonged effect. So again, this is going back to how that medication is produced pretty much. And then it comes into the body, stored in the fat cells, and then released slowly over time. Volume of distribution. Describes the extent to which a medication will spread through the volume, through the body. Medications with a lower volume of distribution have higher levels present in the plasma. Again, that just goes back to how the drug is made and whether it's going to spread out well through the body. Medication metabolism. Biotransformation starts to occur very quickly. As soon as we give it, the medication becomes a metabolite once it passes through that liver the first time. It's either going to be an active metabolite or an inactive metabolite. Active metabolites are still capable of some pharmacologic activities. They might actually change a little bit and cause another effect in the body. And then inactive metabolites, uh, it's like neutralizing them, and so they're no longer able to, to do their function in the body. So something will be biotransformed, become inactive, and then broken down further, and then eliminated from the body altogether. Possible effects of biotransformation. An inactive substance can become active. An active medication can be changed into another active medication. An active medication can become inactivated. Or an active medication can be transformed into a substance that's easier to eliminate. So it's slowly broken down there. Go on, uh, the drug manufacturers know what, what's going to happen. They're the ones who study all that stuff. They're the ones who determine not how the body processes it, but they have to study it, and so they know how the body's going to process it and change it and biotransform it. It's not something that we have to mess with, so just be aware that this is what the body is doing to it, but it's not something we can affect. Okay? 
Most body transformation occurs in the liver. This is something that is important here. The P450 system alters the chemical structure of a medication. And then the kidneys, skin, lungs, GI tract, and other tissues may also cause some biotransformation. But those kidney, skin, and lung, all that is generally used for excretion of the medication. Less biotransformation, more excretion. Liver is our big boy for biotransforming those medicines. That's why if someone has liver failure or cirrhosis, you know, maybe they're super jaundiced or something like that, they're not able to break down those medications as well, and they might stay in the body longer because they can't break it down and excrete it. So just know people with impaired liver function, be very careful with giving them any medicines. Most medicines are removed by the kidneys and then you urinate them out. People with kidney functions or kidney issues, maybe the liver has transformed it, made it inactive, but the kidneys aren't able to excrete it out and remove that medication. So it's still technically floating around the body. Maybe it's become inactivated or it's changed to a different, you know, active metabolite. So that's a thing too. be aware. Two patterns that medications are eliminated, zero order and first order. So zero order, a fixed amount of a substance is removed during a certain amount of time. Kind of like alcohol. Alcohol is a zero order. You drink 10 beers. The body's able to process and remove one beer per hour. So 10 hours, all the beers eliminated, all the alcohol is eliminated. Just a rough example, don't take the numbers there specifically. That is zero order elimination. First order elimination, which is the way the majority of our medications work, it is influenced by the plasma levels of the substance. So the more of a substance that's in the bloodstream, the more the body works to eliminate it. <clears throat> and that's where half-life becomes a big deal whenever we're looking at different drugs. The half-life is, say, one hour. Well, then at hour number two, you would think two halves make a whole, so at two hours it'd be gone. But no, that's not the case. With first order elimination, you know, at hour one, 50% of it's gone. Well, hour two, half of that is gone, so we still have 25% left. At hour three, half of that is gone, so we still have 12.5% left. So that's first order elimination. The body tries to get rid of it more the more that it detects in the blood. There you go. Half-life. Time needed for metabolism or elimination of 50% of the substance in the plasma. Some stuff that, of course, can affect it, disease states, if they're in shock, poor perfusion, and then other medication in interactions. Of course. Medications are administered at a rate, at a dose, and frequency equal to the body's rate of elimination. That way, you know, you hit that threshold and then you're you know, given maintenance doses after that to kind of keep it in the body. Whatever drug it is, you're trying to keep it in the body and your body's excreting at a certain rate and you're matching that rate. Again, that's the drug producers that have done all the science on that. And you can eliminate a little bit of it by air, breathing in and out. Medication errors. Medication decisions are often based on memory and frequently occur in the context of a stressful, life-threatening situation. Throughout the course of paramedic school, you're going to be tested on this both in the book and on paper form, and then in the lab setting will be a majority of your testing on this. You're going to memorize all these different drugs and routes, doses, how they work in the body. We're going to do that through... And we're going to be harsh on you throughout all of paramedic school because we want this stuff ingrained in your memory. And that way, whenever you're in that life-threatening situation or that stressful situation, it comes right back to you. It's just habitual at that point. So some ways to kind of reduce medication errors. Perform a verbal readback of orders if you get online med control or something like that. And they tell you, give one gram of sodium bicarb. You tell them back, hey, I'm going to give one gram of sodium bicarb. Even, hopefully they realize that it's 
done in milli equivalents. So you want to read those back and try to hash out any errors that might be there. Call out medication name and dose. I like to do this uh, anytime I'm getting a bunch of drugs out of the drug box relatively quickly. I'll read it out loud. It, it's just another way of my brain processing that prevents any errors. I don't know. If I've got, all right, fentanyl, 100 micrograms. Rocuronium, 100 mi milligrams. Tomidate, 20 milligrams. And it, it's just another way of my bro body helps prevent any errors there. Label your syringes. Once you drop those medications, put a little F on there with a Sharpie for fentanyl or R for rocuronium or K for ketamine, whatever it is. Label those syringes so you don't get them mixed up because you do not want to start mixing medications, giving a paralytic before you give a sedative. So keep your labels, keep your syringes labeled and keep track of which one's which. Bring along the patient's home medications. If you want to, a medication list is better. You don't really want to be liable for all those medications. If you can get a list, that's even better. But this is just one way, you know, if they're going to a new hospital that they haven't been to before and they're going to be seeing a new provider, that provider can look over those that list of home medicines and give medicines that aren't going to interact as much with that. Use a reliable reference source, as we mentioned earlier, Hippocrates. Physician's desk reference, your protocols, uh, just to prevent errors. Have a partner confirm the dose. If you trust that partner, if you're on a critical call with another paramedic, say, hey, this is what I'm thinking. This is my dose. Is this my dose? And work that out with them. Whenever you're writing down your medications, you should never put a trailing zero after the decimal point. For example... 4.0 milligrams. You should never put that. Just put 4 milligrams. That way it doesn't get misinterpreted as 40 milligrams. Now, you should always put a leading zero before the decimal. So if you're giving less than 1, put a leading zero, zero on there. 0 0.8 milligrams. So always do that. Be careful with your abbreviations, of course, as it gives example difference between magnesium sulfate and morphine. Sub-Q versus sublingual. Be careful with your abbreviations and your penmanship if that's an issue. Okay, another big section here as we get into this. Drugs that act on the sympathetic nervous system. Receptor sites exist in proteins connected to cells throughout the body, and they're activated by chemicals. Drugs that influence the sympathetic nervous system are classified according to the receptors with which they interact. In the sympathetic nervous system, receptors are labeled alpha and beta. Those are our two big ones. Heart has beta-1 receptors on it. The lungs have beta-2 receptors on them and alpha receptors. And then the arteries have beta and alpha receptors. Typically beta... Uh, I'm just trying, sorry. Typically more alpha than beta. So we are going to give alpha and beta drugs to affect the heart and lungs. Epinephrine is a big one. That's kind of the most popular one, but there's lots of different ones that we'll kind of discuss. Sympathomimetic drugs are ones that are going to stimulate that sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight. They have alpha or beta sympathetic properties, depending on what it is exactly. Might be epi, norepi, dopamine but they're all going to affect alpha and beta in the heart and lungs. I like the little examples here. Whereas the alpha, little alpha guy comes into the heart, says, I don't think I'm wanted here because there's no alpha receptors on the heart. All right, two groups of beta sympathetic agents, beta-1 and beta-2. Beta-1 is going to act on the heart. Beta-2 is going to act in the lungs. One way to remember that, one heart, two lungs. You got one heart in your body, and you got two lungs in your body. So beta 1, beta 2. Alpha can do both. Uh, there is alpha typically works in the vasculature, but there is also alpha 1, alpha 2, but it's not quite so important. Don't get lost in the weeds on alpha 1 versus alpha 2. Beta 1 and beta 2 is the big ones. Sympatholytic 
or sympathetic blockers prevent the fight or flight response. It's going to be that rest and digest. Got a beta blocker that comes in and says, ha ha, I got here first. And so the beta stimulator, maybe it's epi, the agonist, is unable to bind to that receptor site because there's already a beta blocker on there. It has a higher efficacy in this case. Beta blockers prevent the beta agents from exerting their full effects. Could be in the heart, lungs, or on the vasculature there. Some different stuff that we're going to use in airway management, not so much respiratory disease, just airway management. So we have sedative hypnotic agents, Tomidate being a big one. It works as a single-dose profound sedative. Has a minimal effect on blood pressure, begins working in 30 to 60 seconds, lasts about five minutes, and you only give one dose of Atomidate. Um, one thing that the Atomidate can do, I was trying to look it up in here, can cause some adrenal suppression, so that's why we don't give multiple doses of it. It's Ketamine is another sedative hypnotic. Works very different than Atomidate, but it is another one that we're going to use for sedation. Causes profound disassociation and anesthesia. Can maintain blood pressure and heart rate. Can also slightly increase blood pressure and heart rate. Depends on which study you read. And it can raise intracranial pressure. Again, that kind of goes back to which study you read. A lot of the more recent studies say, eh, it doesn't really change ICP that much. So, it, but one thing it will do is cause some bronchodilation. So it's a nice drug for airway management. Someone who's maybe a little bit hypotensive, maybe they're in stage COPD or something like that. You're given a breathing treatment. You want to give ketamine because it can also cause some bronchodilation. Very popular drug now for sedation. I wouldn't say it's completely replaced Atomidate, but it is. Seems to be well on its way anyways. It's a good drug. Benzos. When we think of benzos, our big three in EMS are going to be Tomidate, or I'm sorry, Ativan, Versed, and Valium. They're good for sedation, anxiolytics, anti-seizure medications. It's not my first round pick for sedating somebody for airway management. You can treat them to use it. Use them to treat active seizures, and they are all class D, possibly harmful to that fetus. If you're going to use it for airway management and sedation of a patient, Versed is the best one for sedation. There's a separate video that you guys can watch that I've produced that talks about the differences between Ativan, Valium, and Versed. Versed is going to be our first round pick for sedation. But it will it will drop your blood pressure, so be mindful of that. Flumazenil or Remazicon, it is a competitive benzo antagonist, so it's going to compete against that uh, benzo that we gave, and it's going to antagonize it and try to knock it off those receptor sites. So that's uh, it's a, it's a hard one to for EMS to give, because if you're treating somebody with a benzo, they need it for some reason, maybe a seizure. You're sedating them, whatever, and then you reverse those effects with flumazenil, you're kind of screwed. Because then if they have another seizure, what are you going to do? You've already blocked all those receptor sites. They have a higher efficacy to those receptor sites, and they're competing. So you're going to have to really up your dose of the benzo to then treat that seizure that they've started having. So there, it is pretty risky for EMS to give that. We don't. Law services don't carry it just because of that. If you're having to give a benzo, there should be never any indication for us to want to reverse that. Only time we, that I could think of that it would want to be reversed would be someone who took it at home and overdosed on it and is then unresponsive, but we can just intubate them. We don't have to worry about reversing those effects. They can do that at the hospital, and we don't have to worry about any of those potential side effects. 
Chemical paralytic agents provide muscle relaxation, facilitate airway device placement, prevents patient ventilator asynchrony during mechanical ventilation. Fancy way of saying they're bucking the tube and fighting the tube. Binds with the nicotinic receptor sites, antagonizes the ACH or acetylcholine, which normally causes muscle contractions when it's released. They work in two different ways here. Well, we'll look at this picture here. The ACH is released onto those motor end plates, causing the muscle cells and muscle fibers to contract. And the picture on the right, that paralytic agent, those little blue balls, come in and bind up to those ACH receptors and block that ACH from being able to fire off and the muscle contraction. So once you give that, just know that everything in the whole body is then paralyzed. Everything except for the cardiac cells, which have their own automaticity, everything else is paralyzed. They can't move their arms, legs, eye twitching, or anything else because it's all paralyzed. Those motor end plates there are all blocked up. Three different ones that we use in EMS, succinylcholine, rocuronium, vecuronium. Succinylcholine is the only competitive depolarizing paralytic agent. So once we give it, it goes down there, those little that picture on the right again, it actually stimulates all those little muscle fibers to contract just very, very small amount. And then once they contract, it's still blocking them. They cannot contract again. So it depolarizes all those muscle cells. Is the only one that we have in EMS that is a depolarizing paralytic agent. Promise you it's going to be on test. It's a big deal. Depolarizing versus non-depolarizing. Succinylcholine is a depolarizing paralytic agent. The reason that we use it in EMS is because it has a rapid onset and a relatively brief duration. Starts working in like 30 to 60 seconds, something like that, and then only lasts for about five minutes. So then they're going to start breathing on their own after that, once that medication wears off. Some adverse effects, keep in mind hyperkalemia, bradycardia, and elevated intraocular pressure, okay, and malignant hyperthermia. Malignant hyperthermia is going to be one of those genetic factors that we're not going to really be able to know about ahead of time unless we actually ask them and they've they'll tell you, hey, I've got malignant hyperthermia. I've had a reaction to that before. You're not going to know that. You can tell hyperkalemia from the EKG, of course, bradycardia, but know that those are some adverse effects there. Non-depolarizing paralytic agents. This is any other paralyzer that you're going to give. Rocuronium and vecuronium being the two most popular ones. They compete with the ACH at the nicotinic receptors. So going back to this picture here, there are the little blue balls there on the right. They go down, they bind with those motor end plate receptors, but they don't cause contraction of the muscles. There's no little twitching or anything that you'll see. They just bind to it and block it, so nothing can get through. Rocuronium has a relatively rapid onset, uh, one to three minutes, and a short duration. And what they mean by short duration there is 15 to 45 minutes. So succinylcholine has a five-minute duration. Rocuronium, 15 to 45 minutes based on your dose. Vecuronium, longer onset, three to five minutes, I believe. And then the duration is going to be like an hour. So vecuronium is kind of... A, the least popular one. We Typically, we just want to paralyze them while we get that tube. It makes it viewing the airway a little bit better, a little bit easier, relaxes all the muscles in there. And then after we secure that tube, we don't need, a, we don't need to paralyze them again. We just need to keep them sedated and comfortable. So that's why vecuronium is, you know, that's a long time, 45 minutes or an hour to have them paralyzed. We don't we don't really need that in EMS usually. Other airway medicines. Corticosteroids, vasoconstrictors, and bronchodilators. Some other stuff. I think we discussed that a little bit more here. Yes. Beta agonist. That would be our bronchodilators there. Primarily, primary treatment for acute bronchospasm. So this is going to be a beta 2 agonist. 
Cause muzzle relaxation and bronchodilation. Selective, target only the beta-2 receptors. Or there's non-selective that affect beta-1 and beta-2. Albuterol is a beta-2 agonist. It is not super selective, though, so it does have some beta-1 effects, just not as much. Primarily beta-2 agonist. Lev albuterol, like I mentioned before, is that newer medication that is more selective to only those beta-2 receptor sites. doesn't really have any effect on beta-1, which is the heart. Only affects beta-2, the lungs. Albuterol selective beta-2. Typically, you're going to nebulize that, or it's part of an inhaler for bronchospasms. Like I said, lev albuterol is similar, but fewer beta-1. And then terbutaline and epinephrine are some other ones. Terbutaline can be used. Uh, epi is beta-1, beta-2, alpha. It has a lot of, it's not selective if it is beta-2, so it's kind of a last-ditch effort once they kind of almost reach circulatory collapse. Mucotinic and bronchodilator medications like Atrovent, it's going to be an anticholinergic. It actually antagonizes the mucicarnic receptors, causes bronchodilation and decreased mucus in the upper and airway upper and lower airways. So we give it along with albuterol for people who are having this trouble breathing, but it's not working the same way. It's working on different receptor sites, and so that's they have that synergistic effect, and they work together and cause an increase in effect, kind of multiplies the effect of it. And it also decreases mucus, so it can dry up some of those secretions. We are going to give it less often than albuterol, so if we initially give albuterol and nitrovent, and then an hour or two later they require more breathing treatment, they're having increased work of breathing or whatever, sometimes you won't give that ipotropium a second time. You'll just give it once every few hours. Okay. Corticosteroids, methylprednisolone, solumedrol, prednisone, dexamethasone, all those are some different corticosteroids we might give for respiratory issues. They're going to decrease inflammation, dry up secretions. They can suppress the immune system a little bit, and it can cause some hyperglycemia because they're glucocorticosteroids, so glucose regulation there. Generally pretty safe, especially in EMS. We give it all the time. Solumedrol is our big one that we give 125 milligrams all the time for COPD, asthma, pretty much anybody who's having uh, respiratory distress. That is going to be the extent of that for corticosteroids. Leukotrin receptor agonist, I'm sorry, antagonist, taken by the patient with asthma and certain allergies on a long-term basis. So like singular, acolate, those are going to be prescribed to the patient. They're not for emergency use. Just know you might see some inhalers and stuff like that. They have a longer duration, longer onset, whereas albuterol, you know, starts working pretty much immediately. That's why we give it an EMS. Cardiovascular system and medications with that. Antidysrhythmics will target cells within the heart to resolve dysrhythmias or suppress ectopic foci. Vaughn Williams classification groups medication, they group the medication into four different classes. And let me see. Yeah, okay. We do talk about the different classes. I thought it did. The five phases of cardiac cell activity refer back to chapter, what is it, eight, anatomy and physiology, and nine to really get a good understanding of all the different cardiac cell activities. So remember, phase four, the cardiac cells are at rest. Phase zero, the sodium channels open and they start flowing into the cells. Phase one is going to be kind of that peak. Sodium decreases a little bit, potassium exits cells. Phase two, calcium moves in, potassium exits. Then phase three, calcium movement ceases and that potassium outflow continues. Here's a nice picture. You got phase zero. I'm sorry, starts with phase four there at the beginning. And then that sodium starts coming in phase zero, phase one there, the calcium. So we get that increased duration of effect there. Phase two, phase three, the potassium's all rushing out and it's 
going back to that resting potential there. Class 1 antidysrhythmic slows the movement of sodium in cardiac cells. So it's going to have that phase 0. It's going to change uh, phase 0 and kind of help prolong that, slow it down, I should say. Procainamide suppresses the activity of ectopic foci and slows conduction velocity. Lidocaine will block sodium channels and can resolve some ventricular dysrhythmias, suppresses those ectopic foci as well. So know that those are working in phase zero. Class two antidysrhythmics or the beta adrenergic blocking agents inhibit catecholamine activation of beta receptor sites. May be capable of beta-1 selectivity at therapeutic doses. So they can be used to block those beta-1s, so that's one heart. It can cause some bradycardia, hypotension, maybe some conduct conduction dis delays. May be given or may cause massive conduction abnormalities. Whoops! When given with a calcium channel blocker, so they kind of work together synergistically. There, that's going to be a class two. Class two antidysrhythmics again. Metoprolol is kind of our hallmark one. Reduces a heart rate during myocardial ischemia and atrial tachycardia. So that's when we're going to give it. So it's going to slow down everything working in the heart, blocking those beta cell receptors. Class 3, prolong the absolute refractory. So that would be phase, looks like phase 2 up there at the very top. Class 3. It's going to prolong the absolute refractory period so the cell cannot depolarize again during that absolute refractory, refractory period. You use it to treat atrial and ventricular tachycardias. Amiodarone is a big one for that. Controversial treatment for Wolf, Parkinson, and White kind of goes back to which study you read. Most protocols say, hey, it's fine to give even if you have Wolf, Parkinson's, White. May cause adverse cardiovascular effects and life-threatening pulmonary conditions. Well, just know if you're giving amiodarone, they're already in a life-threatening condition, so don't withhold it. Soda law can be taken orally, prescribed to a patient to prevent them from going into those ventricular uh, tachycardias. Class 4 antidysrhythmic medications are a calcium channel blocker. They displace calcium at certain receptor sites or enter smooth muscle cells in place of the calcium. They can also be used to stop uterine contraction. That can be another use for them. Treatment of cardiomyopathy. Decrease the automaticity of ectopic foci and velocity of cardiac contract contraction. So it kind of puts the brakes on everything there. Verapamil and Cardizem are the two big ones for that. Control the heart rate with AFib or A-flutter, so it's going to slow it all down. You can give it IV. They can also be given this, prescribed this. Of course, you want to be watching their EKG while you're doing it. Adenosine is kind of a class 5 or unnamed class. It decreases the cardiac conduction velocity and prolongs the effective refractory period. So the effective refractory period, the heart technically could depolarize again, but we don't want it to during that time. So this is going to prolong that and make the heart more stable. Rapid onset and brief duration. So whenever you give it, it's duration of action is like 10 seconds. We want to give it through a large bore proximal IV, AC, EJ, something like that, and give it very rapidly. Of course, be watching your EKG while you do it. It's going to cause a brief period, three to five seconds of asystole. Then you're going to get some weird heartbeats on there. And then hopefully they'll convert from a SVT into a normal sinus rhythm. That's the idea anyways. Alpha adrenergic receptor antagonist. Prevent endogenous catecholamines from reaching the alpha receptors. So endogenous catecholamines, like epi that's released naturally in the body, it's going to block those. Remember, alpha or epinephrine is a sympathomimetic. It's an endogenous catecholamine. And if you block that, 
it's not going to be able to work. So it's going to lower your blood pressure, could slow the heart rate some, decrease your systemic vascular resistance, kind of relax the vasculature some. So there you go, alpha adrenergic antagonist. Clonidine is a big one for that, primarily an alpha-2 receptor agonist. Phentolamine, labetalol, alpha-1, beta-1, beta-2. Angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors, ACE inhibitors, alter the function of the renin-angiotensin system. Going back chapter 8, chapter 9 of the renin angiotensin system. I know it's kind of a big <laughs> big area there. But what it's going to do is slow things down so angiotensin 1 isn't converted into angiotensin 2. Going to reduce blood pressure, reduce cardiac afterload, help cause a little bit of vasodilation and using that to lower the blood pressure, prevent CHF, cardiomyopathy. One thing that is very popular with that is it Patients who are prescribed an ACE inhibitor have that chronic dry cough. See it all the time. Very common side effect with that. And there is a chance of angioedema. If they're prescribed that and they've never been on it before, and they suddenly have swelling of the tongue, and know that that's probably caused by fresh prescription for an ACE inhibitor. And those are going to... those. Uh, ACE inhibitors are the prills, like lisinopril. Remember that suffix on the end of the medication name? It's going to be a prill. Anticholinergic medicines. Atropine is one. It's a mucicarnic receptor antagonist. We're going to use it to treat bradycardia when vagal stimulation of the mucicarnic receptors is expected, is suspected. So pretty much if they're in a sinus bradycardia, we're going to treat it with atropine. We think that vagal nerve is overstimulated for whatever reason, and uh, you're going to give atropine, try to raise up that heart rate a little bit. Especially with the kids, we want to maybe give a little bit of atropine before we intubate them to prevent vagal nerve stimulation. You can stimulate that vagus nerve by intubating them and digging around the airway. So we want to give that ahead of time, just a pre-treatment. And it's a life-saving antidote for anticholinesterase inhibitor toxicity, pesticide poisoning. We can do that. It's going to take a lot of atropine, but it is a thing. Anticholinergic uh, also is going to be that atrovent or the ipotropium bromide. That's another anticholinergic medicine. It works much differently than atropine, but it is also an anticholinergic. Catecholamines and symp <laughs> sympathomimetics. Catecholamines stimulate the receptor sites in the sympathetic nervous system, that fight-or-flight system. They contain catechol group and monoamine oxidase group. Wow. They are naturally occurring chemicals in the body. Like we said, epinephrine is a big one of those. Rapidly metabolized with a brief duration of action. So whenever we give epi, norepi, dopamine, all those, they have a brief duration of action once we stop giving them. So that's why we might need to get that medication infusion instead of just giving boluses because it's metabolized so quickly. Sympathomimetics, synthetic chemicals that mimic the catecholamines, albuterol, phenylephrine, cocaine is one, various amphetamines like methamphetamine, those are all synthetic chemicals that can also cause that fight-or-flight response. And they have a longer duration than catecholamines. So these are all just different medicines that can ramp everything up. Heart rate, bronchodilation, constrict blood vessels, all that good stuff. Epinephrine stimulates alpha, beta-1, and beta-2. So alpha is our vasculature. It's going to cause vasoconstriction. Beta-1 is going to be our heart. It's going to stimulate that to beat harder, faster, stronger. Beta-2 is going to be our lungs. It's actually going to cause a bronchodilation. It can be administered IV, IO, IM, sub-Q, nebulized, endotracheally, however you want to give it. Speaking, it's going to 
you want to give it based on what you're giving it for. Let me let me rephrase it. Can dramatically increase cardiac workload and myocardial oxygen demand. If we were to give it IM or sub Q, it's not going to increase cardiac workload near as much as if we give it IV. Remember the whole bioavailability thing and how quickly it's absorbed in the body. IV is like a direct, direct punch to the heart there to get that cardiac workload going. Whereas IM or sub Q is much slower. We're going to give that for anaphylaxis. <sighs> Norepinephrine stimulates beta-1 and alpha receptor sites, more alpha than it is beta. So it's going to increase workload of the heart a little bit and constrict blood vessels quite a bit, help raise that blood pressure some. Continuous IV infusion because it goes back to short duration of action, so we have to do a continuous infusion of that and titrated based on patient. It can cause tissue necrosis, tissue necrosis if extravasation occurs or if they're on a very high dose for a longer term. Because norepinephrine is causing vasoconstriction, and if you're on a high dose of that, you're constricting the vessels, you know, maybe in the hand, and so you can actually cause decreased circulation to the fingertips, stuff like that. And if you're on that long term, as in a day or two, high doses, and you don't have blood flow to your fingertips, well, guess what's going to start dying? Your fingertips. So we always just want to titrate it to get that blood pressure, get a map above 65. We don't want to have super high doses of it just to help prevent any long-term effects. Dopamine, primary medication for hypotension, refractory to volume resuscitation. Eh, sure. Just depends on what the reason for that hypotension is. Uh, dopamine is one of those dose-specific specific medications, lower dose, less than 5 micrograms per kilogram per minute, is going to cause some renal and mesenteric artery vasodilation. So you're going to increase blood flow to the kidneys, less than 5 micrograms per kilogram per minute. 5 to 10, you're going to get beta dose, so it's going to cause a little bit of bronchodilation and increase the heart rate, contractility, that stuff. And then above 10 micrograms per kilogram per minute, it's going to get the alpha dose, vasoconstriction. So if you get above 10, say you're running at 20, 20 is our top for dopamine, you're not getting rid of that beta dose and the dopaminergic or renal dose. You're just getting alpha on top of it. So you're getting all renal, beta, and alpha effects in the body. Keep that in mind. Dopamine is similar to dopamine. It's a synthetically manufactured one. Um, it stimulates more beta-1, though, and less beta-2 and alpha. So it's going to hit the heart a little bit harder and not the vasculature quite as much. Milrinone, kind of like dopamine. I'm sorry, kind of like dobutamine. Uh, you can give it IV or orally. It's going to increase cardiac contractility while causing dilation of systemic arteries and veins. So you'd think, well, that seems kind of silly. You're going to increase workload to try to raise the blood pressure, but then you're also going to dilate the arteries and veins. Well, that's that's what you want sometimes with heart failure and stuff like that. So you're going to get better cardiac output, but you can also not raise the blood pressure. Of course, don't want to do it long term. Phenylephrine or neosinephrine. I always think of this as a nose spray to dry up that and stop nosebleeds. But it's pretty good alpha agonist. It's going to cause a lot of vasoconstriction. Doesn't really have any beta effects, but it's going to just tightly squeeze that vasculature. Vasoconstriction, that's what it's for. Of course, extravasation is a major concern, like we mentioned before. Digitalis, man, I think that's really lost popularity. I don't see it very often, um, but it slows conduction through that AV junction, slows down the heart rate, can improve some cardiac output. Heart's able to be a little bit more efficient, efficiently. Has a lot of adverse effects. Has a very small therapeutic index, so it doesn't take much from that, like we talked about, that 
effective dose to the median toxic dose or the median lethal dose. You don't want to take extra of it. It has a very small therapeutic index for that. Direct vasodilator medications used for the management of uncontrolled hypertension, CHF, MIs, cardiac ischemia, and examples of that, nitro. Nitro dilates veins, <clears throat> veins and to a much lesser extent, coronary arteries. Nitro is a very good venous, venous dilator. So we're going to use that to reduce preload on the heart. It will open up coronary arteries a little bit. Primary purpose, though, dilating veins. So the heart doesn't have to beat as hard. Relief of chest pain and decreased blood pressure. And then it gives IV dose there, 5 micrograms per minute up to 200. Or if you're giving it as a spray or tablet, it's going to be 400 micrograms. That is the standard adult dose for that. Prone to cause tolerance. So it didn't take very long before you had to get increased dose of that. Tablets prone to degradation. They have to be protected from light. You know, if somebody's carrying around in their pocket, and by the time you get around to using it, it's not a tablet anymore. It's just a bunch of powder in there. So that's a thing. And if they're taking medicine for erectile dysfunction, don't want to give nitro for that, if, if that's the case. It can cause very severe hypotension. Sodium nitroprusside. It's a potent IV vasodilator affecting the smooth muscles of veins and arteries there. does both. You can use it for cardiogenic shock if you need a vein vasodilator. Probably going to do that on transfers mostly, not so much in the back of the truck, starting someone on the drip like that. But it is duration of effect or duration of action is very short. So once you stop that infusion, it's going to go away very quickly. Hydrolyzine for hypertension. Dilates the arterioles, lowering the pulmonary and systemic vascular resistance. So it's going to decrease afterload on the heart, those arterioles. You can also give it for pregnant patients with eclampsia or preeclampsia. Blood pressure is too high. Flowland, potent vasodilator again, inhibits platelet aggregation, continuous infusion for some, not typically administered for the first time in the pre-hospital. I don't know that I've seen that actually administered, but it is a thing. It could be handy, though, if you get a vasodilator and inhibiting platelet aggregation. I mean, that's what aspirin does, so I could see why that would be handy, but obviously there's more to it than that. Diuretics. Helps get rid of volume, fluid volume in the body. Helps the kidneys work a little bit better. So you can get rid of volume and improve respirations, get fluid off the lungs, good stuff like that. Or uh, out of the head. Lasix is going to be a loop of Henle. Working in the loop of Henle in the kidneys to help flush out fluid pretty much and decrease volume. It will also change your electrolyte balance, so be mindful of that with those patients who are taking Lasix. They're getting rid of potassium as well, so they probably need to be on a potassium supplement. Whoops. Manitol. Manitol is an osmotic diuretic. It works really well in the head. It's going to draw fluid out of the extravascular space and draw it into the vascular space so that it can be excreted out better. So if someone has increased ICP, head injury, something like that, you could use mannitol to help decrease it. Cerebral edema. Antihypertensive agents. Diuretics or beta blockers may be used to help lower that blood pressure, of course. Just know that sometimes they might have orthostatic hypotension. So they're fine when they're sitting down or laying down, but as soon as they go to stand up, they get lightheaded, they might pass out. It's that orthostatic hypotension. It's the body is not able to comp compensate for them standing up quite as quickly. There's a nice little chart there talking about different medications for cardiovascular system. Please review all that. Wouldn't say you have to commit it to memory, but at least review it. Whoops. 
blood products and medications affecting the blood. <clears throat> the average adult has about five liters of blood in their total body. Makes up about seven to eight percent of the total body weight. <clears throat> Trauma or medical conditions can alter the total amount, composition, or performance of the blood, obviously. Blood components are type specific, cross matched, and unmatched. Those would be <clears throat> the three different classifications for that. If the choice is not clear, of course, contact on the med control or sending physician. But for us, if we are given blood in the pre-hospital setting, it's going to be O negative. It's going to be an unmatched type specific blood. It is a universal donor, or it is good for anybody type blood. has the least amount of adverse reactions uh, whenever we're not able to test the blood before giving it to them. If you're taking it on transfer from a sending facility, hopefully they have typed and cross-matched all that, so it has a very low risk for adverse reactions. So that would be like the difference between A, AB, RH positive versus negative, and they can test it for some other stuff to help cross-match that to make sure any other components of the blood are compatible. <clears throat> Blood products require careful monitoring during administration, of course. Pulse rate, blood pressure, temperature, fever is a big indicator of there's some sort of reaction happening, so we want to stop the blood transfusion. Um, if a indwelling urinary catheter is present, also monitor for changes in the urine color. Makes sense. You're going to be given that blood and then also have typically a saline bag hanging with it that will be administering through the same IV. So once that blood transfusion, the blood product itself is done, then you can flush it in with some saline or they'll be running together. If you're unsure about any of that, <clears throat> it's kind of a higher level of care, or it is a higher level of care, so make sure you just talk with your sending facility about, hey, how do, I, how do you want me to run this? Do you want me to give all the blood first and then give some saline or give it together. If you're ever unsure about any of it, talk with your sending facility or sending physician. So different types of blood products that we might have. Packed red blood cells. So this is where they've got the red blood cells. They've taken out a lot of the water, a lot of the plasma, and so it's more concentrated. A unit contains approximately 225 to 250 milliliters of concentrated red blood cells. <clears throat> and patients at risk for volume overload require slow administration and careful monitoring. Makes sense there. Assess lung sounds, make sure we don't fluid overload them. If you give one unit of packed red blood cells, then typically we'll raise the hematocrit value by about three. It says it raises the hemoglobin by one and the hematocrit by three, generally speaking. Packed red blood cells typically given over no longer than four hours per unit. All of them I've ever seen. You run it in pretty much as fast as it'll go in. There's not, never been a risk of taking more than four hours, but I could see that being an issue maybe if you're in an ICU setting or something where you want to give it slowly. Units usually contain a citrate-based preservative, which can cause some toxicity in the blood if you're giving multiple units. So uh, hypocalcemia is a problem. So sometimes they will give, if they're having to give multiple units, they'll also give a calcium supplement with that to prevent hypocalcemia. Hyperkalemia can be a risk as well. Fresh frozen plasma used to treat impaired blood clotting. The plasma has a lot of the clotting factors in it, a lot of the water of the blood, doesn't have any red blood cells, doesn't have any oxygen carrying capability, more for clotting factors. So that can be used for trauma, hemorrhage, warfarin toxicity. They've got too much of that blood thinner in there. Disseminated intravascular coagulation or DIC. Anything where they're worried about increased risk of bleeding, they can give just plasma to help the blood clot better. Must be compatible with blood type, but does not have to be RH compatible. So if you give it to a patient with type A blood, doesn't matter whether it's A positive or A negative, as long as it's type A blood or AB. Again, units 225 to 250 milliliters. 
and they are of course frozen so you want to defrost them blood giving blood you know all of it's stored cold or frozen so <clears throat> with any of these blood products we want to defrost it bring it up to room temperature some systems might actually have a warmer so before it goes into the body it brings it up to body temperature cryoprecipitate it's a blood product that contains a concentrated assortment of blood clotting factors without the additional volume of that is an ffp so it's actually more of just an injection type volume versus giving you know a 250 milliliter bolus of that fresh frozen plasma we mentioned i think i went the wrong way there we go platelets used to correct thrombos thrombocytopenia so you don't have enough platelets in there must be blood type and rh compatible and specific so if you just don't have enough platelets to carry that oxygen you can give that Blood platelets combine with coagulation chemicals to terminate bleeding. When clotting occurs, a thrombus is created. Medications can alter the ability of the blood to form a thrombus. Yep, all that makes sense. TXA can be used to promote blood clotting and reduce mortality in trauma patients with severe bleeding. Recommended dose, 1 gram over 10 minutes as an IV infusion. <clears throat> So what this will do, it will prevent the breakdown of clots in the body. Your body is naturally always trying to, you know, build up and break down clots and replace them. What this will do, TXA does, is prevents the breakdown, that conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin, I believe. Don't quote me on that part right there. Um, but it, it prevents the breakdown of clots so that the body will stop bleeding internally more quickly <clears throat> the military uses a higher dose they'll give one gram iv push and then they'll hang another gram over 10 minutes that is probably going to come to the civilian ems world pretty quickly that's what i prefer to do whenever i have to give txa i can call an online med control and say hey this is what i've got this is what i've given can I go ahead and give a second gram of, of TXA? Anticoagulant medications impair the function of clotting or coagulation chemicals in the bloodstream. Enhances the function of substances in the blood that inhibit clot formation, like heparin or Lovenox. So there's a lot of times where we've got too much clotting up. Maybe the blood has been very static. Someone's laying there, not really moving around so they don't get good circulation and the blood clots up because it's just not moving around much so there's times when we want to give these anticoagulants to prevent the, those blood clots from forming or to break down types of blood clots fonda paranux is administered to prevent or treat deep vein thrombosis warfarin is a common anticoagulant <clears throat> want to be careful whenever we give warfarin or whenever we see that patients are on warfarin and then we are wanting to give them something like aspirin know that their blood is already pretty thin and we want to be careful and mindful of any type of increased bleeding or if someone is on warfarin and they fall in and we want to be very mindful of any type of internal bleeding that might have occurred from that if someone is on a blood thinner or anticoagulant they are getting tested regularly for uh, their clotting times, the prothrombin time, and the international normalized ratio, or INR levels. All that testing has to occur pretty frequently to make sure that they haven't gone too far and thinned that blood too much and put them at too much of an increased risk of bleeding, if that makes sense. So PT, INR, PTT times, all that has to be tested pretty frequently for these people that are on anticoagulants as a at-home medication. Antiplatelet medications prevent new thrombus from forming or extending out. Include aspirin, Plavix or Clopidogrel, Ticlid, and the glycoprotein 2B2A inhibitor medications. Like 
Absicam, tyrofibin. I'm not real familiar with those, but they are the glycoprotein 2,3, 2B, 3A inhibitors. Aspirin, of course, we're going to use it to prevent the formation, you know, those clots or those platelets from sticking together makes it everything slide through a little bit easier prevents that platelet aggregation and sticking together clopidogrel is kind of like that but a little bit stronger <clears throat> fibrinolytics will dissolve the blood clots in the arteries and veins can cause life-threatening hemorrhage Avoidance of multiple IV attempts and unnecessary trauma. Prolonged pre-hospital time may preclude administration. So fibrolinolytics are going to be used to break down blood clots. Maybe someone's had a stroke. We want to uh, reverse those symptoms. They can be given a fibrolinolytic at the hospital to help break down those blood clots. Obviously, if you're breaking down blood clots, you are going to dramatically increase the risk of bleeding into the body. Opioids. Medications used for neurologic conditions. Opioid narcotic medications. Used as an analgesic. Stimulates opioid receptors to relieve pain. Primarily MU receptors. <clears throat> Known to cause tolerance, cross tolerance, and addiction, of course. Can cause profound sedation, respiratory depression, and apnea when excessive doses are administered. That can be both a side effect and... Kind of what we want it to do. Positive effect sometimes. Depends on the patient and what's going on with them. Morphine, known to cause nausea or vomiting in up to 60% of patients. A lot of times if you're given morphine, you just automatically give Zofran or something, Phenogren, to go along with it. it. may produce a histamine response, causing a little bit of itching, fleshing, diaphoresis. That's not a... Technically an allergic reaction, it's just a histamine release caused by that morphine. Fentanyl is the synthetic version of that. More selective, like we talked about, better at selecting those receptor sites. Doesn't cause near as much nausea or histamine release. Doesn't cause the hypotension that morphine can cause. <clears throat> Pretty safe drug, as long as it's given in a clinical setting. Narcan, it's going to... Reverse the effects of an opioid medication. Doesn't do anything else for any other medication. Only if they've had an opioid. Fentanyl being a big one. If they're overdosed on benz ben benzodiazepines or anything else, though, it's not going to have any effect. Efficacy is dose-dependent. Remember, it is a competitive antagonist. And you only want to administer enough to correct life-threatening conditions. So, personally... Someone overdoses on fentanyl, and they're just sleepy. Okay, that's fine. I'll let them ride. Somebody overdoses on fentanyl, and they're agonal respirations. All right, now's the time for Narcan. I want to give just a little bit, maybe half a milligram, one milligram, just so I can restore that respiratory function. I don't necessarily want them to be ANO times 4, GCS 15. I want them breathing. I don't want to have to fight them on the way to the hospital, because... If you reverse those effects altogether, now you've ruined somebody's high. They're going to be pissed off. They could start vomiting. They could have other issues. I just want to bring them back from the brink of death by a little bit. So I'm just going to give them a little bump of Narcan just to help them breathe. Make them a little groggy. And then we'll take them on into the hospital. Phenytoin or phosphenytoin. Phenytoin? Yeah. Opiate antagonist medications. They're more for seizures, though. They're Yes, they are an opiate antagonist, technically, but they're not like Narcan, where they're going to reverse your effects of fentanyl or, or morphine, something like that. They're, these are for seizures. Funny how that works. Maybe received on a long-term basis, over-the-counter, not over-the-counter, but uh, at-home prescription, I should say. And they can also be given as an IV. There's fewer adverse effects from the... Cybrex, cerebri, cerebix than there is from the dilantin though. Maybe it's a little bit newer medication, a little bit more selective. Medicines for GI system, histamine 2 blockers, decrease acid secretion in the stomach, prevent histamines 
from stimulating receptor sites in the parietal cells in the stomach. It includes Antac, Tagamet, and Pepsid. <clears throat> when someone's having an allergic reaction, they have an overproduction of histamines, H1 and H2. So you can give something like Pepsid in the presence of an allergic reaction to help with that as well, giving Benadryl and the Pepsid together. Antiemetic used to treat nausea and vomiting. Phenagrin and Compazine, kind of older medicines. They can be given orally or IAV. There are quite a few side effects with that, so they're not given, they're not as popular as they used to be, say, 10 years ago or so. Can cause some cardiac dysrhythmias, dystonic reactions, um, a lot of different stuff, so that's why they're not used as much in EMS. Reglin increases GI motility, actually, which seems counterintuitive, but it does help with nausea. IV orally or IV infusion. 5-HT3 receptor agonist, that's going to be the Zofran, prevent certain mechanisms that induce vomiting. The one thing that Zofran doesn't do, or the 5-HT3 receptor antagonist doesn't do, is prevent motion sickness. It doesn't really help with that. If someone tells me they're getting sick, I'm going to go ahead and give it, because it's relatively safe, but know that it's Good chance that it's not going to work for motion sickness. If I remember correctly, I believe it was actually developed for cancer treatment and cancer-related nausea and vomiting, if my memory serves me correct. Sometimes it does. Sandostatin. Synthetic version of somatostatin decreases secretions of insulin, glucagons, growth hormones, and various other chemicals. Has many potential uses but not really in the pre-hospital setting. So that's something else that could affect the GI system. Tylenol. I think we all know Tylenol. It is an antipyretic and has analgesic effects. You can find it in all sorts of different forms. Relatively safe. It is a heavy hitter on the liver. So if someone's in liver failure, it's not something you want to give because it can harm them. And if someone overdoses on Tylenol, it is primarily going to damage the liver long term. You can get IV. They make it IV formula for that. And it's pretty good for analgesia. You know, it's less risk of potential abuse than fentanyl or morphine or something like that. So some systems have switched to a, a non-narcotic pain control system so they don't carry morphine or fentanyl, they only carry maybe Tylenol or something like that and just give it IV form. Calcium, you can give that for calcium channel blocker overdoses, of course. Magnesium toxicity, prevention of dysrhythmias, calcium replacement with hypocalcemia, calcium restoration from hydrofluoric acid, and the prevention of hypotension. So there's a lot of different uses for calcium. One thing to keep in mind with calcium is it will, if you're giving it IV, you can only give it by itself in that IV. You can't give anything else on top of it. Otherwise, it will cause it to precipitate, I believe, and it won't mix well. There's calcium chloride and calcium gluconate. Calcium chloride is three times stronger than calcium gluconate. Yes. Calcium chloride is three times stronger than calcium gluconate. Dextrose, you want to give that through an IV, large IV if possible. If you're given D50, it's really thick, syrupy, because I mean, that's all it is. It's sugar and water. Uh, so veins don't really like that. So you want to give it through that big IV. We... A lot of places now only carry the 10% dextrose solution. In the book, you know, it says infants receive weight-based doses of 10% dextrose. Well, guess what? Everybody can receive 10% dextrose. Just give them 25 grams if they're an adult. A lot safer if you do extravase it, extravasation of it. It's a little bit safer because it's a lower concentration. You can still have therapeutic effects, raising that blood sugar up. 
D10 has been very nice. Diphenhydramine, competitive histamine 1 receptor antagonist. Remember, I mentioned giving, if they're having an allergic reaction, giving that Pepsid, which is an H2 antagonist. Then diphenhydramine is that H1. So it's going to help uh, dry up secretions and get rid of hives. <clears throat> All that can have some mild sedative effects. There's diphenhydramine. Glucagon, naturally occurring peptide manufactured commercially. Use it to treat hypoglycemia whenever you can't get an IV. It is very expensive per dose, though, so we want to try to get an IV several times before we switch to glucagon. Provides increased heart rate and contractility. Treat severe calcium channel blocker overdoses. Treat a patient who has a foreign body lodged in the esophagus. So if you're given it for calcium channel blocker overdose, and to increase that heart rate and contractility, you have to give a large dose, several grams of it, 10 grams of it, something like that. A lot of EMS services, because of the cost of it, they might only carry one or two grams on the truck at a time. So you're not going to really be able to have much effect if they're having a calcium channel blocker overdose. That's why we carry calcium. It's much cheaper, and we can just give that for the calcium channel blocker overdose. If you're giving it for a foreign body, <clears throat> Glucagon will cause smooth muscle relaxation in the esophagus. Kind of a crazy thing, but it can help loosen up the esophagus so that foreign body, that food, can go ahead and move on down into the stomach. So there you go. Toradol or Ketorolac may be used instead of analgesic. It is not an opioid. It is an NSAID, same family as aspirin non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. It inhibits prostaglandin synthesis, causes analgesia, give it IV or IM, and you don't want to do it with anybody who's got suspected of trauma or GI bleeding because it is an anti-inflammatory. It's an NSAID. While it's not the same as aspirin and causing decreased platelet aggregation, it can worsen bleeding just slightly, so we just want to avoid it with anybody with trauma or GI bleeding. Toradol is a great one for kidney stones. Very effective for treating people with kidney stones. And because of the way it's metabolized in the body and excreted in the body, if we're giving it to someone older, 55 years or older, we want to reduce that dose. Typically from 30 milligrams down to about 15 or milligrams or so. Just because the older folks aren't able to get rid of that. Magnesium sulfate. It's an electrolyte. You give it for ventricular dysrhythmia, specifically torsades. Correction of hypomagnesemia. Prevention or treatment of seizures in pregnant patients with preeclampsia. And the reason that we're going to do it with that, and we can avoid those benzos. You know, remember those benzos are pregnancy class D. They can cause fetal harm, whereas magnesium is thought to be a little bit safer. It's going to cause that smooth muscle relaxation. And a lot of times, whenever you're pregnant and having seizures, it's because that blood pressure, that eclampsia, is the issue. And so if we can cause smooth muscle relaxation, we can lower that blood pressure, stop that seizure. There's mag for you. Keep in mind with mag, if you're given it, you can lose deep tendon reflexes. There can be some side effects with higher doses of that if you're taking a transfer of uh, like a pregnant female who is on magnesium drip to try to prevent them from having the baby till you get to the other facility you might lose some deep tendon reflexes you want to watch for respiratory depression you know because it is a smooth muscle relaxer watch for that respiratory depression and if you do notice any of that stuff just shut it off immediately that way you don't worse anything so watch them closely Sodium bicarb is an alkalinizing agent, changes that pH, makes them more alkaline. Hyperkalemia can actually help stabilize the cardiac cells a little bit if they're hyperkalemic. TCA overdoses, it also causes some cardiac cell uh, stabilization. Promote urinary excretion of salicylate chemicals and certain tissue waste products. And then, of course, excessive administration can cause some 
volume overload, alkalosis, electrolyte abnormalities, cerebral and pulmonary edema. Thiamine. Commercial medication preparation of B1, vitamin B1. Used to correct thiamine deficiency, given IV, unlikely toxic and adverse effects when therapeutic doses are administered. So someone who's severely malnourished, you want to give them thiamine before you give them dextrose. Helps their body process it a lot better. And those who are uh, high alcohol users as well, they might have a thiamine deficiency. Well, there you go. There's chapter 13. I know that's a big chapter. Listen to it a couple times. Watch through the slides. Remember, all these drugs are in the back of your book. We have videos for all these drugs. Review them. You're going to have to memorize all the drugs. While you don't have to memorize every little thing that I've mentioned in this video, uh, it is all very important. So, good luck, guys. You guys are doing great.